We're going to be looking at that story in the Word right now. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, we're going to be looking at verses 45 to 54 this morning in Matthew 27. Last week, if you were here, you'll recall that we looked at a lengthy passage from Matthew that described Jesus' suffering and crucifixion. And as we looked at that passage, it was almost impossible not to wonder how Jesus felt as he was mercilessly mocked, punched, slapped, spit at, flogged, and then nailed to a cross. Today, as we look at what happened while Jesus hung on that cross, we're going to consider how God, his Father, felt. I've entitled my message, God's Emotional Response to the Cross. I I, I should tell you that there are theologians who assert that God does not have emotions, They contend that references in Scripture that ascribe emotions to God, like anger, delight, pleasure, grief, or regret, are figures of speech called anthropopathisms. It's a word that means attributing human emotions to something, in this case, God. I, I could not disagree more with those theologians. The Bible says that we are made in God's image. That includes, I believe, our intellect, emotions, and will. In other words, we have emotions because God has emotions. And if that is true, it stands to reason that God was never more emotional than when he watched his son suffer and die on the cross. And we are going to see that he expressed those emotions in profound ways, all of which were saturated with spiritual significance. We're going to begin by looking at verse 45 of Matthew 27. Now, from Jesus is on the cross... Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's noon to three, three hours. Ironically, when Jesus was born, God made a dramatic statement by lighting up the night sky near Bethlehem as the brilliant, blinding glory of the Lord shone upon unsuspecting shepherds. As Jesus was dying, God made an equally dramatic statement by shrouding the world in a dreadful darkness. It began at noon when the sun is at its zenith And Jesus had been on the cross for about three hours. And it lasted until 3 p.m. Now, some have suggested that it was a solar eclipse, but that's not possible because it was Passover. Passover comes at the full moon. Some have suggested that the darkness was due to a massive sandstorm that coincidentally blew through Jerusalem while Jesus was on the cross. If that was the case, however, surely Matthew, who had a penchant for detail, would have mentioned the wind and the sand in his account, as would the other gospel writers. What is more, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that there was darkness over all the land. Land can also be translated earth. And though it is not possible from the text to determine just how widespread this darkness was, 
there are some references in extra biblical literature that suggest the darkness was worldwide. Pilate wrote a report to Tiberius, the Roman emperor, that assumed the emperor knew about this widespread darkness that lasted in this report, he said, from noon till three. Furthermore, two church fathers, Origen and Tertullian, made reference to Roman historical records and archives that documented this widespread darkness. But what is its significance? The purpose for the darkness is not explained in the Gospels. It's not explained elsewhere in the New Testament. So we have to make some theological assumptions here based on reflection. We do know that darkness was often associated with sin and evil in Scripture. And that there are several references in the Old Testament where darkness is associated with God's judgment. With that in mind, consider, and we sung many songs and heard some scriptures already about this, consider what Isaiah prophesied 740 years before Jesus lived on the earth. He said that the Lord would lay on the suffering servant the iniquity of us all and that he would be crushed for our iniquities, our sin. Peter said, he himself, Jesus, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And Paul said, he who knew no sin became sin for us. As Jesus suffered on the cross, as he was dying, it seems reasonable to interpret the darkness as God's judgment against sin. The darkness, therefore, was a manifestation of God's wrath being revealed against sin as he funneled his wrath upon the body of his sinless son, which bore the sins of the world. And so the darkness, I believe, was God's first emotional response to the cross. Verse 46, and about the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The four Gospels record a total of seven statements that Jesus made while hanging on the cross. This one, the fourth of those seven sayings, is the only one recorded in Matthew. Perhaps because of the power and significance of Jesus' cry of dereliction here. Matthew preserves the Aramaic in his account and then translates it into Greek. It is noteworthy that this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus did not address God as Father. And while this statement my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is recorded in Psalm 22.1. Jesus was not quoting scripture here perfunctorily. Something was occurring at the moment Jesus said this that made him feel enormous anguish as though he was being abandoned by God. 
Now, don't forget, Jesus and his Father had experienced perfect, unbroken, uninterrupted communion with one another for all eternity. (laughs) All eternity. But when God transferred the sins of the world upon Jesus' body, he turned his back upon his son for the very first time. Why? The prophet Habakkuk declared of God, your eyes are too pure to behold evil, and you cannot look upon wrongdoing. And so, since God cannot deny himself, when he who knew no sin became sin for us, God could not look upon his son. Thus, the communion between the father and the son was mysteriously broken. And sensing this abrupt loss of communion, Jesus lets out this loud cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But we should bear in mind that this separation was not a dissolution of their relationship. Jesus did not cease to be God's son here any more than a child who sins against his earthly father ceases to be his child. But Jesus temporarily ceased to experience the intimacy that he had always known with his heavenly father. And because that love and intimacy was so deep, far deeper than any of us can comprehend. It was extraordinarily painful for both Jesus and the Father. This is the second of God's emotional responses to the cross made by God the Son. Verse 47 And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Apparently, Despite the loudness of Jesus' cry in Aramaic, it, it was not understood by at least some of the bystanders. In Hebrew, the word for my God is not so very different from the word for Elijah. And some of those near the cross thought that Jesus was calling for him. Elijah, you'll recall, had not died in the usual way, but had been taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. He didn't die at all. Furthermore, in the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi predicted that Elijah would come back to earth just before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Because of this, Many Jews in the first century viewed Elijah as a sort of miracle worker who could be called up to rescue those who were being oppressed. And it's possible that some of the bystanders at the cross thought that Jesus was summoning Elijah for this purpose. When someone offered him sour wine, a mild analgesic, that might give Jesus some slight relief from his misery. The crowd protested, wanting him to remain desperate. 
in order to see if one miracle worker might indeed show up to help another miracle worker. Verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. John, in his account, reports that immediately before Jesus' death, just right before, he cried out, it is finished it seems likely that this was that very cry. If so, it points to the completion of the saving work that Jesus came to do. Now he had given up his life as a ransom for many. With that loud cry, he yielded up his spirit. It's interesting, none of the gospel writers use any of the usual words that describe someone dying. This may be part of the way that they bring out the truth, that there was something in Jesus' death that set it apart from all other death. Because there appears to be an element here of voluntarily relinquishing his life. He yielded up his spirit. Verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain was in the Jerusalem temple and it separated the most holy place, the earthly dwelling place of God's presence from the holy place where the priests performed their duties. This curtain signified that mankind was separated by separated from God by sin and that a holy God could not be in the presence of sinful men only the high, the high priest was allowed to pass beyond this curtain to enter in to God's presence and he had to follow a very strict protocol First, he had to offer a sacrifice for himself and his family. Then he had to offer a separate sacrifice for the sins of all Israel, thereby making atonement and securing God's forgiveness. And this happened only once a year on the Day of Atonement. This curtain in the temple, was a constant reminder to the Jews that sin makes humanity unfit for the presence of God. The fact that the sin offering was offered annually and countless other sacrifices repeated daily showed graphically that sin could not truly be atoned for or erased by mere human or mere animal sacrifices. And so when this massive veil, 60 feet high, four inches thick, was torn in two from top to bottom, it dramatically symbolized that Jesus' death the shedding of his own blood as a sacrifice was sufficient atonement for our sins. It provided real forgiveness. It opened the way into God's holy presence for people for all time. Jesus, through his death, removed the barriers between God and man. And now, according to the writer of Hebrews, we may approach him with confidence 
and boldness. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That word confidence in verse 19 is a word that has to do with free or open expression or conduct. It's just the opposite of having to walk on eggshells or cower in fear. We can feel comfortable and unashamed in God's presence because our sin and guilt have been removed by Jesus. We can feel right at home. Now, this does not mean that we have permission to be flippant or arrogant or cavalier with God, it doesn't, but it It doesn't mean that we shouldn't fear God. It simply means we can approach the throne of God with confidence. Confidence in what Jesus, our great high priest, has done for us. This is the third of God's emotional responses to the cross. Look at the middle of verse 51. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. In the Old Testament, God's presence was often accompanied by an earthquake. When he appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, the whole mountain trembled greatly. When he appeared to Elijah on a mountain, it says a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke into pieces the rocks before the Lord. And after the wind, an earthquake. Isaiah, Jeremiah, David also tell us that earthquakes are associated with God's wrath and judgment against sin. So, Could it be that when the earth quaked and the rocks split at the death of Jesus, God was venting his pent-up rage against sin upon Jesus? Or could it be that God was expressing his intense grief over the death of his son? In either interpretation, God was making himself known and providing yet another dramatic emotional response to the cross. Verse 52, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Wow. You probably know this. You've maybe seen Ben-Hur or other uh, historical accounts of what it was like in those days. Tombs were carved in rock outcroppings above the ground. Not like we do it today. And so it would not be unusual for these terms to burst open in a large earthquake. But an earthquake does not explain how many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Notice, it was not all the saints, but many, a selective group 
that the Lord had chosen. You, you probably know this. There were literally thousands, tens of thousands of Jews who had been buried in tombs outside the walls of Jerusalem. So who were these saints? Why were they chosen? I have no idea. And Matthew who is the only gospel writer to record this miracle, doesn't tell us. We know that saints literally means holy ones, so we can assume that these men and women were devoted to the Lord. Were they followers of Jesus who had recently died? Or were they saints in the Old Testament who had eagerly anticipated the arrival of Messiah? We, we cannot be certain, nor do we know who any of them are, how many of them there were, why they were selected by the Lord to be raised, how long they remained alive after his resurrection. What we do know is that these saints came to life when Jesus died. And that after his resurrection, they went into the heart of the city of Jerusalem and met many people. This has theological significance. Often, and I've been this way most of my life, we uh, theologians assert that the resurrection of Jesus is the basis for the resurrection of the saints. But here, Matthew connects the death of Jesus to the resurrection of the saints. There's something in his death, something about his death that also conquered death. Not just sin, but death. Just as the rendering of the temple curtain makes it clear that the way to God is open for all. So the raising of the saints shows that death has been conquered. Matthew is giving expression to his conviction that Jesus is both Lord of the living and the dead. And that's a yet another divine exclamation mark regarding the significance of the cross. Look now at verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. You probably know that the centurion and those with him were Roman soldiers who were assigned the gruesome duty of supervising crucifixions. Undoubtedly, they had seen many, at least the centurion had. Historians tell us that by the time of Christ, the Romans had executed by crucifixion 30,000 people in Palestine alone. It's easy to imagine these soldiers as hardened and desensitized by the time Jesus was crucified. Yet we are told that they are filled with awe, literally fear, terror. These soldiers, after witnessing the death of Jesus and the phenomena like the earthquake surrounding his death, were terrified. So terrified that they were convinced Jesus had to be none other than the Son of God. By the way, truly, does not mean maybe. It points to certainty. He really was the Son of God. All right. I've entitled this message, 
God's emotional response to the cross. I I, want to be clear about something. God was not having a meltdown when Jesus was on the cross. Nor could we describe his reactions as emotional outbursts. Let's not forget that God not only knew that Jesus would become a sacrifice for sins when he inspired Isaiah the prophet to write about it 740 years before Jesus was born, but Scripture tells us that God knew about this and planned it even before he created the world. What happened on the day Jesus was crucified was the pinnacle of God's plan to save the world through him. And as I said earlier, God's responses to the cross, even his emotional responses to the cross, have enormous significance for us all. First, he diverted his wrath from sinners like you and me and funneled it upon the body of his sinless son. That's consequential for every one of us. Second, by rending the temple curtain from top to bottom, he signified that through Christ, we now have access into God's presence 24-7. And third, He not only took care of our sin problem, but our death problem. And we'll get into more of that next week at Easter. But please bear in mind that this dramatic story of Jesus' death on the cross accompanied by all manner of special effects was not divine theater. God did not do this for entertainment purposes, nor did he do it just to show us how he felt about sin or how he felt about his son. He did it for one reason, because there is absolutely no other way for human beings to be saved from their sin and from the penalty of their sin which is eternal separation from God in hell. Jesus died on the cross in our place. He was was punished instead of us for our sin. That's what Paul meant when he said, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's no other way except by what Jesus did. And there's one specific and one necessary application for us. If we are to personally benefit from Jesus' death on our behalf, hear it, it. This this is very important. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I benefit from Jesus' death on my behalf when I believe that he bore my sins in his body, that he was punished by God instead of me for my sins, that I am helpless to save myself apart from what Jesus did for me, and it's only through him and what he did on the cross that I'm forgiven that I have peace with God, and that I have eternal life. Friends, please don't leave here without considering whether or not you truly believed in him. When you see Jesus on the day of judgment, 
and he were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? It's not going to cut it to say, because I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church every Sunday. I did this, 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 and I jumped through all these hoops for you, Jesus. Aren't you impressed? No, no. The only thing that will let you into heaven is saying, Jesus, I put all my confidence in what you did for me. 100% what you did. I trusted you to save.